Uh, first off, yes, thank you for inviting me to the event. Uh, and thank you for trusting me to even get up here at last minute's notice. <laughs> you don't know what's coming. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm happy to talk uh, about this topic of uh, cross-channel attribution. Um, but first I wanted to do, how much time do I have, by the way? About 20 minutes? 20, 25. Yeah. Perfect. A um, little quick introduction uh, of myself, uh, and then a bit of, of an introduction on SAP. Uh, and then I'll jump into uh, the cross-channel attribution work that we've been doing, uh, believe it or not, since 2011, uh, when we first, uh, I first started to think about this and realized that it was the way of the future. Um, despite the accent, uh, I'm originally Welsh, which, if you know Britain, um, is a very different accent from the rest of England and Scotland and Ireland. Um, but I also am a Canadian, having spent 18 years in Toronto. You can tell Toronto people because they say Toronto, not Toronto. Uh, and just last September, I got my US citizenship. Um, so I'm, uh, I've got three passports now. <laughs> so it took me 19 years to get my citizenship, but uh, I'm very happy to have it. Um, and a friend of mine from uh, Washington actually came up and did the swearing-in ceremony in, in New York. Um, so my, my uh, life took me, well, uh, my parents took me to Arabia when I was five years old, uh, and I grew up on the beach. And I want to thank you for choosing this location, because yesterday I got to go jet skiing, and that is my all-time favorite thing to do in the world. Uh, I was a jet ski instructor for three years in, in Bahrain, um, was my college job, and uh, anything you did as a college job, if you get to do it again, it makes you feel young again, right? Um, then it was uh, Toronto for college and uh, um, my first career, yes, in Barclays private banking. Um, and then two years, uh, essentially going back to school between 96 and 98, uh, because Barclays closed there, and, and they said, hey, the government will play, pay for a retraining program for you. And I said, uh, great, you know, what, what are they going to retrain me in? you know, some other element of banking. And they said, no, you, you can choose. And I'm like, oh, geez, what, what am I going to choose? My roommate at college was always doing gaming on, on these green screen computers and chatting on messaging boards and everything and told me, you know, how the internet was evolving. And so I said, okay, let's try this internet thing. So I uh, went to school for two years and got an internet uh, digital marketing certificate in 96 to 98. So uh, pretty early on in terms of being able to get an education in that. Um, and uh, then I joined SAP, uh, which is the German software company, in case you're wondering, not the button on your TV that turns everything into Spanish. Um, and by the way, if I could exclude all of those visitors to our website, bounce rate would improve immensely and conversion rates would double. Um, please don't go Google SAP for that, for that and go to our site. Um, but I'm sure a lot of you have some similar issues. Um, I've worked in digital from the beginning of that time, so uh, 21 years. Uh, takes us back to, what, 1998. Um, and SAP is a, is a really interesting company because when I first suggested we do a Google Ads campaign uh, in 2002, um, my boss said, why would we use Google? That's for buying digital cameras and, and holidays or research and stuff, isn't it? And I showed the query volume for ERP software, and it was something like 25,000 queries a month. And they're like, wow, why are they searching on Google? And people just didn't really get it at the beginning. Um, but it turned into a very successful campaign. Um, and I remember saying, I just want $4,000 to pilot this and test it. And he said, Don't, no, you can't have $4,000. And I said, OK, 400? Uh, and he said, no, you better use 40,000. Otherwise, no one will listen to you when you have the results. So I spent $40,000. It was great. Doubled my budget every year. Got up into the multiple millions. Uh, and then people started saying, hang on. One search click produced a million dollar software deal? That sounds a little suspect. So then they started taking off the high deals from my performance numbers. Uh, and actually, that's why eventually I got into the topic of cross channel attribution. So I, I needed to prove that everyone was getting appropriate credit and how valuable search was, both paid search and organic search. Um, and, uh, but I have touched almost everything else in digital at SAP. I'm sort of the incubator in chief. Um, I started off with web analytics, um, then into test lab. We set up a very formalized test lab for doing RAB and multivariate testing uh, using the original Adobe test and target. 
Um, social media brought that into the company. Again, people like, why social media for enterprise software? Didn't quite figure it, but uh, yep, really important. Um, and uh, then uh, most recently, cross-channel attribution. So if we jump to the, oh, I have my own clicker, don't I? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a German train. By the way, I've always thought that the best ad for SAP would be if you want German engineering in your car, Mercedes, Audi, why wouldn't you want it in your software? Um, but we haven't gone there yet. Um, so, um, by the way, one other thing that, that's going to be exciting about this trip is tomorrow, uh, today, this afternoon, will be my second time only picking up a golf club. <laughs> so, uh, I don't think I will do our brand ambassador, um, Ernie Els, any, any credit by performing well. You know, what's a handicap? You'll see what a handicap is today. Um, anyway, so let's uh, jump into the attribution journey because it's been pretty exciting uh, for us and delivered us some uh, very valuable insights uh, and really allowed us to bring the rest of the organization, both marketing and sales, uh, along with the ride for us. So the first bit, um, it's got to start with the customer. Um, the customer interacts with all types of, of digital and offline media uh, at all times. Um, we, you can't really just focus on the silo of just search or just paid media or just anything because the customer is exposed and will seek out content through any channel uh, or any space, online or otherwise. So you have to have a really good understanding of where your customers are, where they're gathering, uh, but also what kinds of messages they're interested in and how you can help. So we have a mantra at SAP, which is stop selling, start helping. Um, and that really imbues everything we do in terms of our messaging. It, it's not the hard sell. Enterprise software purchasing is a very complicated process. Uh, it can take um, 6, 10, 15, or 20 people, two months, six months, a year, more than a year, depending on the size of the, of the project. Uh, to actually decide. Now imagine how many digital touch points there are in that. Are you going to think last click attribution from one individual is going to be the right answer for what gave value to that million dollar or hundred thousand dollar deal? Absolutely not. In fact, any model like last click or first click um, or even even click, like evenly distributed, you imagine the, the, the curve from first click to last click and everything that happens in between. You might heavily weight the first or heavily weight the last. Um, change the shape, shape of that curve as much as you want. Uh, it's never going to be exactly right for every situation. We have products uh, and solutions that range from a $1,000 training course you can book online in five minutes with your credit card, right up to those large uh, you know, cloud S4 HANA deals uh, for multi, multi-million dollar um, corporations. Um, in fact, just to give you an idea of the scale of SAP, 77% of global transactional revenue goes through an SAP system or touches an SAP system at some point. 77% of global transactional value. So we really need to understand how people are getting to the point of choosing an SAP system and how we can optimize our uh, media mix uh, and really get the most, as I like to say, the biggest bang for our euro, um, but uh, the biggest bang for whatever uh, currency you're working in. So, multi-touch attribution, um, there are many analogies. Uh, one is basketball, but I don't play basketball, so I had trouble sort of getting, explaining that one. Uh, a relay race is a little bit easy to understand. It might not be perfect in every, in every respect, um, but you really want every runner in a relay race to get the appropriate credit. You might have the person who is the best sprinter at the beginning to get the early lead. Uh, again, a very fast sprinter at the end to pull away from the pack, but in the middle you really need consistency and maintain uh, a, a, good, a good track score, a uh, time, time score. Um, and again, if you don't give appropriate credit to all your runners, you won't have the right model. If, if you miss out one of those runners and don't give them any credit, at some point someone's going to just look at data and go, runner number three, not adding value, drop them from the team. With last click attribution, you'd say runner number one, two, three, four, five, no value, drop them from the team. One guy's going, where are my runners? I'm on my own here. Um, you really need to understand the value that every single piece contributes. Um, so I think most people in this room uh, would understand what attribution is. Um, you've got multiple touches. You've got 
something at the beginning that puts someone on the radar at the start. Uh, you've got something at the end, that's the opening touch, the closing touch, and then the various uh, touches in the middle, and you've got a result at the end. Sometimes, sometimes you get a result. That's when there's a, a conversion. A conversion can be anything. It could be that software sale. It could be that training store sale. Uh, it could be just a registration in a lead gen process. You decide what it is your conversion points are. We have many. Um, it also varies but not only by product, but also by country uh, and by uh, pers persona of the target audience. Then you have to understand um, what is it that implementing cross-channel attribution capabilities will actually allow you to do. Um, so it allows you, first off, uh, to understand how your channels are working together uh, to support your goals. Most importantly, where to spend your money. Assuming you have a fixed budget, how do you allocate that budget appropriately to get the maximum value from that recipe at the end? Um, if you're baking uh, a cake, you're not going to say, oh, let's just do even. We'll have the same amount of sugar, flour, eggs, you know, and everything, and hope that it works out. It probably isn't going to work out. Um, so understanding the value each channel contributes and how sensitive it is, the propensity to increase or decrease of where you are on the S-curve for each channel in terms of contribution and the impact that each channel has on other channels. All those things have to be understood to actually pick that point of spend in order to get the, most, uh, the highest performing recipe. And very important for us, and I'm sure for many of you, if there's a change in budget circumstances at any time of the year, how do you change your allocation uh, in order to opt, you know, take that as, a, as an advantage? In uh, the early years, when I was managing uh, paid search, I managed our paid search program from when we started it in 2002 for about 12 years. Um, and at some, some times in the year, there would definitely be you know, a budget constriction. And being the biggest line item in the budget sometimes, paid search was often the largest cut, but especially at the end of the year, we all know that paid search and, and paid media in the last month or two of the year is really valuable. And certainly for a longer sales cycle company, um, that's contributing to your Q1 uh, pipeline. And you really don't want to shoot yourself in the foot with that. So if your budget does go down, or even if it goes up, what's the best rejig of that recipe uh, to get the best out of a possible challenging situation? Um, there are multiple attribution models um, that we can think of. Uh, the first one, last click, definitely not. You make any decisions based on that, and they're bound to be wrong. Um, the second one, even, again, cake. Not sure it's going to turn out so right if you have three pounds of baking soda and three pounds of flour. Um, Rules-based, this is a little bit better. Maybe this one is, is front-loading uh, the opening touch and, and back-loading the closing touch and diminishing a little in the middle. Um, regression actually says that the things later on in the process are, um, can be more important. These, as you can imagine, vary by product. So let's say we're talking about something brand new in the market. So when SAP first really pushed um, the cloud business, uh, we weren't necessarily known for, for cloud computing uh, at the beginning, so an opening touch would be considered that much more valuable in a cloud sale than it might be in a standard uh, on-premise ERP sale. Um, if you have a very homogenous product, um, like it may be some sort of a training course for us, uh, many of our partners give training courses, yep, they're all teaching how to work with the same piece of software. Um, so the last touch, you know, once you're on that shortlist, what's the last clincher that actually gets you the deal? That could be more important, and you'll backweight that attribution um, curve. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going. Why am I going backwards? Okay. Uh, a couple of other models. Um, basic lift. Uh, this looks at uh, converters and non converters. I remember earlier I said if you have a conversion, there are many times when let's say a simple e-commerce sale like the training example or, or a, an on, online purchase um, for, a, for a consumer product. Um, you may have people going through one, two, three, four, five touches, but they don't buy. Just because they didn't buy doesn't mean that those five touches didn't tell you something and that you couldn't learn something from those. Did touch one, two, and three really contribute to getting that person to touch four? 
Can that teach you something about getting more people to touch four if that's a dark spot uh, on your customer journey? Absolutely, it can teach you a lot. Um, so the best model is algorithmic, algorithmic um, attribution, taking non converters and non-converters into account. And there are multiple platforms uh, these days that can do that for you. Uh, SAP has our own attribution platform solution, part of our marketing cloud now. Um, when we first thought about this in 2011, there weren't even any vendors providing this type of uh, uh, capability. Uh, I remember the first meeting we had, we had about five or six agencies, including our uh, SEO and paid search agency at the time, Acronym Media, who's here in the room, uh, also in New York. Um, and we had uh, an analytics agency, we had other media agencies, we had about five or six different SAP teams, and I remember standing up in this huge boardroom with about 28 people, and I said, okay, we're here to talk about cross-channel attribution and how to optimize our, our investment mix in marketing. And the hand came up, and it was, what is cross-channel attribution? The second hand came up, what are we trying to solve for? And so it began, you know, it was, it was a challenge. And certainly trying to get executives to understand when I said, this is the price tag, and they're like, how much? Um, and uh, it, was, it was a tough sell. Uh, but because it was a tough sell, we were put under what the book, if you've read the book, A Beautiful Constraint. Anyone read that book? It, it's a great book. Um, basically, it, it talks about if there, you have some sort of a constraint, whether it's budget, resources, short time frame, how you can turn that negative into a positive. Um, and our beautiful constraint was we were told, if you're going to do this and spend that much money, it's got to be ROI positive in year one. So let's just go into a few of the, the learnings. Um, some of this data is uh, sort of, it says demonstrative, but it's, it's sort of tweaked or concealed a little bit to, to protect some, some uh, elements. Um, they could think of this as the pool of people who showed up on the radar when we first turned on attribution. Uh, at, at the beginning, this was a cookie, uh, cookie pool-based model. And yes, you're going to say, what about all, all the people who are deleting cookies and the platforms and, and browser settings that can remove cookies? We found that as long as you had roughly 30% um, of your audience data collected, you could make appropriate decisions uh, on attribution. Uh, when we started, we had about 70% coverage. Yes, that's been dropping slowly. There are other things you can do about that. Um, but if you have enough, if you have at least 30% of your data, you have enough to make some intelligent decisions. That's, that's the main message. Um, so think of this chart as um, if you look at the pool of cookies, how many cookies in that pool, for example, at the bottom right-hand side had just one touch? So this cookie representing person X uh, has one touch and it's one channel, and it's display. Um, we've got massive volume, but the conversion rate is really poor, um, less than 1%. Then we looked. This is, this is without doing anything. This is just wiring up the data collection and looking at what's happening before we even did anything proactive. Um, second one, if they had display and they visited a microsite. Uh, less than half the volume, but nearly twice the, the conversion rate. You can work your way right up to the top and see that stellar conversion rates came from a display, a social media touch, and, and we had challenges differentiating between paid social and organic social. Uh, we've pretty much solved that now, uh, and paid search. So if a person was, was exposed to those three channels, um, and this could be multiple touches of each, then that was most likely to, sh to represent um, the highest conversion rate for us. The challenge, of course, is that they're over here on the left, which is very low volume, and we wanted to take what was working up here, and the action would be to how do we increase the number of people exposed to mul multiple channels, and that drove a lot of our strategy as well. The next and I think most insightful thing we learned was that um, if we look at frequency of exposure, and this is across all tracked channels, so display, paid search, organic search, organic social, paid social, email, uh, everything digital at the beginning. Um, and then you start to count up how many uh, records were there in each cookie, how, how many touches were there. Um, anyone with one, two, or three touches, zero conversions. Uh, it starts going up in sort of the seven range. It reaches a peak uh, around 12 but it diminishes around 25, and then it's pretty much zero conversion for all the rest of the, 
for the folks that are, have all those multiple touches down there. And by the way, a lot of that volume, if you were to put a chart of which channel that was, uh, that's display. So it becomes more and more display as you get out to the right-hand side of that chart. So the sweet spot for us was 7 to 17 touches. That told us two things. One, people are having to search around and find seven pieces of content, seven interactions with us uh, through any channel, or, and, and up to 17 before they actually were willing to register on the site and start the lead generation process. Um, that was a good insight, but it could and probably does mean that our content is a little confusing and people were having to dig around and really you know, find uh, what they were looking for. So we looked at those paths and we tried to take the highest volume similar paths and uh, the phrase we used was to Teflon coat those paths to make them far more easy uh, to, to pass through. Uh, also to shorten the sales cycle for people going through those most common paths. And once you've done the most common, you can go to the slightly less common, you know, and over time you'll, you'll get to the bulk of your activity. Um, the way to do that is, you know, if, if someone has only seen a paid search ad uh, and they're now seeing, uh, you know, a social interaction, then if they haven't seen um, email yet, then put an email subscription at the bottom of the social page. All sorts of things like that you can do through any channel to try to increase the number of channels that they're exposed to and have a correct sequence in the messaging from the awareness to the consideration uh, through to the purchase process. Uh, this chart finally shows us um, the difference between uh, last click attribution versus true multi-touch attribution and how the credit differs for each channel. Um, I don't think I have a laser. Do I have a laser? Maybe I do have a laser. I have a laser. <laughs> Um, so let's look here first at paid search. Um, with multi-touch attribution, um, paid search got 20% more credit than in a last touch model. Again, don't think of this as one individual, but the entire pool of individuals with all of the data uh, summarized. Uh, email got 75% more credited value in a multi-touch environment than a last touch environment. A display off the chart, 660% more value, but still fairly low. Um, undefined, we, we dug into this and found that it was a lot of people moving between our microsites and our campaigns and within our global website and our country websites. Um, other referrers, uh, organic search here actually got a drop. And at the time, I was running organic search and paid, paid search. So this was a mixed message for me. Um, but by doing this, um, and providing this capability to the rest of the marketing organization gave that much more credibility to my claims that organic and paid search, or search in general, and our other paid media activities were contributing significantly to lead generation. That allowed me to increase my budgets and increase effectiveness of the team. Uh, organic social surprised us right at the beginning. We knew we had a stat of uh, people who came to our website from Facebook uh, were 2.4 times more likely to convert to a sales lead than people who came on average to the website. So we knew social was important. Organic social really shone out of the park here. What we don't have here um, is it paid social because at, this, at the stage that I took this chart, um, which is the only piece I'm allowed to share <laughs> publicly, um, it, it was not possible for us to split that out. Um, so that gives you an idea of the dramatic differences in value um, that you would see. Uh, between a single touch, whether it be first or last, uh, and a multi-touch, uh, more sophisticated attribution model. So, uh, the results. Um, and I think I'm probably running out of time. Um, everyone's waiting for lunch, I'm sure. Um, let me jump to the chase. Uh, we drove about 1.1 million euros uh, per annum on average in media efficiency. Um, be careful to describe this as media efficiency, not media savings, because anyone with a media budget is like, what? So you're going to take that much away from my media budget? I'm not interested. Uh, you know, go and sell that idea to someone else. Um, but uh, it, it, as a percentage, it generated 43% in media. There were savings and efficiencies. And think of it back on that chart that showed um, the 7 to 17 touches. Um, when you do typical paid media frequency capping, let's say it's 25 is your cap, um, you'll stop at 25 paid search, paid touches. 
and you'll save money on the rest. We found that out of those 25, there might be 20 that were social and SEO touches and five that were paid. So in that case, we would stop the paid at five touches. We just saved 20 touches in paid that we knew were not going to actually drive any value. That was a massive source of efficiency. Uh, and I think encapsulates the whole idea of cross-channel attribution is by looking across all of the channels, you can optimize each channel more effectively as part of the overall recipe and the model. Um, we did drive a positive ROI oops, um, of 2.2 against our target of 1.5x in year one. So this project was allowed to continue um, and uh, became much larger after this. So that's it for our experiences with cross-channel attribution. Happy to take any questions. Crispin, thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Anybody? Over here. Hi, I'm Monica um, from Chaka Marketing. So I just have a question with the lift in, um, even in search that you saw from the true attribution. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of qu the question that many advertisers really have is, the difference between generic search and brand search. Um, and, you know, the question that I often get is, why should I have my branded ad if I'm first an organic? Um, so just kind of curious, you know, your perspective on that. Wonderful hot button topic. <laughs> uh, and I think you could probably divide the room into two groups. Um, groups where paid and organic search sit within one organization and have one budget. It might be a small half of the audience. Uh, and other, other companies where paid search and organic search sit in, sit in different groups with different budgets. Um, at the time when we kicked this off, I managed both organic search and paid search so we could move funds in between. Uh, we had that beautiful constraint of occasionally being told to turn off paid search so we were able to suddenly see the terrific experiment, what happened to organic search when paid search was completely turned off. And a lot of paid search was brand. Um, and our organic search did more than compensate, particularly on the brand terms. So as long as your SEO and your brand um, organic result is treated like a campaign and not just set and forget, here's my page title, here's my description, but you regularly update some of those features so that it's topical, relevant, um, and reads like you know, a good explanation and a call to action, and you've got a good click-through rate on your organic that you'll see in Search Console, um, then this model will work. Your, your organic search can carry the weight for brand that uh, paid search does. Um, but if you have paid search in a silo, the paid keywords obviously perform really well. So paid search on its own will look like it's performing really well if you include brand terms. If you take the brand terms out, you'll get a, a quite a significant decrease in performance of, of paid search overall, and you may have challenges getting the budget you need. So you really need, even if they're in different groups, you should try to experiment with bringing down your paid search on, on the brand terms, but then look at the overall result of search, organic and paid together, uh, and have that be the basis by which you're evaluated whether this was a good move or not. But, and then you want to recycle that money into the non-brand, particularly where in organic search you're not ranking. It may be for new products, it may be for something where the people who outrank you are ones you can't leapfrog, like Wikipedia or a bunch of other uh, factors. Um, so you need to choose your battles in organic search. We have six um, squares, can't call them quadrants, sextants, six sextants, um, where if this is what's happening in paid search and this is what's happening in organic search, in each of the six boxes, it's what you should do. For example, if you have great performance for a keyword in organic search and in paid search you're not bidding on it, start bidding on that keyword if it's affordable. If it's not, start looking at the derivatives and other options, but get into the paid market for that keyword. Uh, if you're starting to increase and you've seen more than a 10 or 20% increase or you've got to a striking distance improvement in organic search, then you can start to reduce your bid on paid search. You probably always want to stay in the market to some extent, um, but uh, yeah, you, you'll, you'll, you have to come to the correct balance and you, unfortunately you have to do it at the keyword level. So uh, we have a hybrid model, as I say, of agencies and in-house. Um, so if you have enough uh, fingers on keys, you can do that and again, start with the big stuff, work your way down and you'll within a couple of months get to you know, the vast majority of your activity.
Crispin, I knew when I talked to you last night that we had to get you on stage. And thank you very much for doing this. You're welcome. Week. Thank really you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Crispin, by the way, Crispin and, uh, and his, his friend and old friend of Media Post, uh, Mike Rahan, is, uh, will do a roundtable on Wednesday on attribution. We can only squeeze so much at the last minute. But they've agreed to, uh, to do a roundtable together on, on that topic. So you could ask him. Of course, you can ask, he'll be here.